It, it is it is getting better but abhi vac the vaccination is just we are on live sir yeah go ahead sorry go ahead Sunil sir, you are uh, you are on mute, sir. Mean me? Good morning, one and all. Myself, Dr. K. T. Sunil Kumar, Associate Professor, Division College of Pharmacy. It's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Division College of Pharmacy. We are delighted to have you all with us today to participate in ACT sponsored. one week online short term training program sri vishnu college of pharmacy was established in the year 1997 by late padma bhushan dr p v raju founder chairman to provide quality education svcp bimavaram has been imparting knowledge and skills among pharmacy graduates to cater the needs of the pharmaceutical industry in both r and d and manufacturing it was the first private pharmacy college affiliated to andhra university visakhapatnam svcp was the first pharmacy college in ap which was accredited by nat and uh, our bpharm program is nba accredited the institution currently offers bpharm pharmd mpharm six specializations and phd courses our college has been recognized as a research center by the andhra university at uh, at svcp we constantly strive to keep the advanced knowledge and skills for all the students and faculty in this context at svcp department of pharmaceutics and regulatory affairs are organizing an act sponsored short term training program for faculty of pharma on advances in pharmaceutical formulation and the regulatory pathways globally for small molecules medical devices and biologics from 22nd february to 27th february so with this introduction i would like to invite our director dr kumar vs namani to give opening remarks and welcome to our today's first speaker dr om perumal over to you sir a very good morning to each one of you Uh, indeed, it is my pleasure to invite uh, each one of you to this uh, fifth faculty development program being organized by Sri Vishnu College of Pharmacy. On behalf of the management and staff of Sri Vishnu College of Pharmacy, I would like to invite each one of you for this webinar. 
So this webinar topic that we uh, selected uh, for this fifth FDPS advances in pharmaceutical formulations and regular pathways globally for small molecules, medical devices, and biologics. I think this covers the entire spectrum of the pharmaceutical industry anywhere in the world. It is indeed my pleasure uh, to see uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Wong. It is very auspicious to start with the presentation with Dr. Wong and the whole room. And he's duly qualified to be the inaugural speaker of this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, he's a Naipur Mali alumni and first batch uh, PhD. I'm sure you all uh, will be delighted uh, with this talk. And the topic that is selected is 3D approach in drug delivery. I think it's very apt, it's very uh, advanced, new techniques. And it's very relevant to this uh, new generation that is about to come, the formulations. The topic is uh, very, very uh, exciting to me. I hope you also like the same. And uh, you know, I'm also thankful to all the, the speakers who have accepted our request in a very short notice. And every speaker is uh, eminent and expert in their own field. I'm sure uh, you all uh, like to all my talk too. So we just conducted uh, uh, many webinars in the past during the COVID, and the response is so high that is motivated us to conduct one after the other webinar. In fact, we are planning a one more webinar that is faculty development in the next week in the uh, field of pharmaceutical practice. I wish all of you uh, participate actively and make use of this opportunity and interact with this uh, <laughs> try to know the advances and also the benefits that one can accrue as a faculty as, as a student to pass on to the next generation. So with this note, I once again thank you all and have a good session ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, uh, for your welcome note. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Dr. Om Perumal. Uh, Dr. Om Perumal is a professor and uh, department head for pharmaceutical sciences in the College of Pharmacy and uh, Allied Health Professions at South Dakota State University. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacy and a Master of Science degree in Pharmaceutics and a PhD in Pharmaceutics. Dr. Om Perumal has completed his postdoctoral training at the University of Kentucky and uh, Wayne State University. He has 15 years of teaching and research experience in academics. Dr. Perumal has held various leadership positions at South Dakota State University. He received various uh, awards and recognitions. Dr. Perumal also serves as the coordinator for the PhD program in the pharmaceutical sciences. He served as the director of an interinstitutional translational cancer research center between South Dakota State University and the Stanford Research. As the department head, he has the experience of leading a successful academic and multidisciplinary research program in pharmaceutical sciences. The technologies developed by the department faculty have resulted in 30 patent applications six issued patents and seven technology development licenses with various startup companies. Dr. Perupan worked with uh, the Dean to successfully raise funds for two endowed faculty positions. Dr. Perumal has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers, several book chapters, and made over 100 presentations in several national and international meetings. As a principal investigator and co-investigator, Dr. Perumal has received funding to the tune of $4 million. His group has developed and licensed several new drug delivery technologies. And he is the recipient of Patricia Walker Skin Research Award from the Skin Cancer Foundation and Butler Award for Excellence in Research and Intellectual Property and Commercialization Award from the South Dakota State University. Dr. Perumal has participated in several leadership programs, including the Academic Leadership Fellow Program of AACP, SDSU, and Assessment Academy and Philanthropy Academy. So with this uh, brief introduction, I hand over this session to Dr. Perumal. Sir, session is over to you. So can you see my slides? 
Dr. Kumar Sunil, uh, can you see my slides? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can see the slides and voice also clear. You can start. Okay, so I'm going to turn off my camera so that it's not distracting. So, so first of all, uh, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Sunil for the kind words and the kind introduction, and also the organizers uh, and the uh, and the college administration for the invitation. So it's indeed my pleasure to be here. Um, I hope I do justice to the talk. Um, definitely, uh, Dr. Kumar has raised the expectations. So I'll try to do my best. Uh, to to talk about the 3D approach to drug delivery. So before I start, I just wanted to uh, just, uh, tell you this: this is going to be a very broad overview of the drug delivery. It's I mean I'm not going to talk about regulatory aspects and which I'm not an expert in. So I'm going to give you an overview of uh, in a, in a way an evolution of drug delivery, but more importantly, what are the recent advances and where we are going with the drug delivery uh, overall. And in that regard, I definitely I'm not going to talk about my work, but what's, uh, what's uh, happening and you know, what's in the current state in the field. So most of the work that I'm going to talk about, uh, whether it's, it's already in development or already in the, in the market. So I'm not going to present any of my data in this uh, presentation. So before I, I start, maybe just an overview of the university. So uh, many times when I give a talk and people always wonder where, where, where in the world is South Dakota? So looking at the map of the United States, uh, South Dakota, people, some people think it's actually south, but, uh, you know, but actually it's, it's in north. So it's uh, south of North Dakota. So definitely we are at this time of the year, very, really cold. In fact, uh, last week, uh, or last 10 days, I should say, uh, the whole entire United States were in the freezing with the Arctic blast and we were in the sub zero and minus 20 or so. So really it's cold out here, but I think the lately, you know, this week has been better. So it's warming up. So by Indian stand still it's cold freezing, but for our current uh, South Dakota stands, definitely it's warm for us. So uh, South Dakota is known for, uh, it's uh, called the Mount Rushmore state. Um, so the west side of the state, uh, we have a modern carving of the four important presidents of the United States of America. So it's a big tourist attraction from all over the world. In fact, there's a uh, big uh, tourist, uh, tourist, a big revenue generated for the state. It's a, a primarily an agriculture state, but also you know generate a lot of revenue because of the tourism. So the population state is it's a, it's a very very sparsely populated. We are roughly eighteen thousand uh, people in the state, and in fact we get more visitors to the state. We almost get two or threefold the visitors to Mount Rushmore than the actual population of the state. The university is in the east side of the state, so we are two time zones. So the west uh, west side of the state is actually one hour. Behind us, it's called modern time, and we are in the central time. So this is the view of the view of the campus. So uh, South Dakota State University is one of the five uh, universities in the state and is one of the largest in the state. We have roughly 11,000 students uh, with various programs from agriculture to arts and science to pharmacy. And this is some of our uh, football uh, teams, which is jackrabbit. Actually, indeed, because of COVID, a lot of football games have been postponed. In fact, the first game started last Friday. And uh, then we also, of course, have baseball and our, our basketball, especially women's basketball is very, um, uh, very well known in this region of the country. So the pharmacy program. So we, uh, we are a college of pharmacy and allied, allied health professions. We have uh, uh, pharmacy, of course, PharmD, a four-year pharmacy professional program. We have a PhD program in pharmaceutical sciences. And we also have, a, we are going to start a master's in this coming fall. And uh, we also have medical lab science, bachelor's medical lab science, uh, bachelor's of respiratory care, and an online master of public health. So we, um, our college, you know, in pharmacy, there are roughly, if you look at the United States, there are 140 plus schools of pharmacy in the United States. We, uh, we are, I would say, in the top five in terms of the uh, ranking, in terms of the board exam, national board exam pass rate. We have had 100% pass rate, 98 to 100% pass rate the last 20 years. So. We have pretty good reputation in, in a, you know, in a graduating well-qualified pharmacist uh, and, and especially in this region, but also nationally speaking. So in addition, uh, the department focuses on, uh, uh, cancer is a big focus area of the department because we focus on all aspects of uh, drug development, starting from medicine, chemistry, synthesis to pharmacology, and definitely drug delivery is a big, uh, big emphasis in the, in the department. But I would say we're relatively a small department of uh, 10 to 11 faculty. But, uh, but we, I would say from expertise standpoint, we pretty much span from the entire spectrum of the drug development from drug discovery to the, um, the pharmaceutics. So this is the, the, the one on the bottom is actually the 
the picture of the uh, pharmacy building. So we have we are we are actually in the um, third second floor pharmaceutical science and then the on the north side of the buildings where our research labs are. So I talked about some of things. I know uh, Dr. Kumar at last time asked me to uh, say a few things about the college. So it's 140 years old college. So the College of Pharmacy is as, as old as the university because it's one of the first colleges started in the campus. As I said, we have offered a number of programs and especially uh, students who are in the audience, if they're interested in the graduate programs, definitely we offer a, a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences because we require TOEFL and GRE. But the new masters would also be interested. Uh, this would be include both non-thesis and thesis track. Of course, we are not at start it. It'll start in fall 2021. And it only requires, we only require TOEFL for the masters. So to coming back to my topic and uh, some of the slides uh, you might have seen in my previous presentation. I, I really like those slides because I want to connect really this presentation to what I presented almost a year ago. Uh, talk, talked about a little bit about biopharmacokinetics, but I just want to bring you back to the drug discovery and development. So if you look at the drug discovery and development, and this, uh, these two important discoveries were, I would say, revolutionary in the, in the, in the pharmaceutical world. On the left-hand side, what you see is the discovery of insulin, which was uh, in, in Canada, uh, Banting and Best, who, as you, you know, went on to win the Nobel Prize. But during it, almost the same time in the 1920s, on the other side of the Atlantic, which is in Europe, you know, um, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. Now, the interesting thing about these two discoveries, if you look at it, you know, one uh, uh, penicillin, of course, it, uh, you know, ushered an era of antibiotic before they didn't have any antibiotics. And the other one is insulin, because it, it started the whole uh, biotech era. And of course, we are talking about a lot of protein therapeutics in the market, actually, it started way back with insulin. insulin. Now, if you're looking at both of these things, uh, more or less, they were a serendipitous discovery. In other words, it's more by chance than by systematic, systematic approach. But since then, if you look at a lot of the drugs that have come into the market, they are more rational drug, uh, uh, drug discovery and development process. So, you know, going back to again insulin. So, if you look at the um, in in the in biology, the information flows from, of course, the DNA into the uh, protein. But actually, the discovery was exactly the reverse order. So, first. And the protein was discovered, of course, then, you know, you have double helix uh, by uh, Watson Crick in 1960s, of course, in 2000, then you have genome, uh, whole human genome mapping. So if you look at all of this thing, I mean, if you look at the way uh, the drug development has evolved over a period of time, currently we have more than 50 to 60 percent of drugs, the new drugs come in the market of biologics. But it way back started the discovery of insulin way back in 1920s, of course, in the 1980s, the first recombinant uh, insulin was, uh, you know, introduced in the market. Because now we, you know, we recently with the mRNA vaccine. In fact, now we have even mRNA-based uh, therapeutics in the market. So this is actually a slide from a very commonly used slide from Pfizer. I think this one talks about the, the discovery of uh, new medicines from an idea to development all the way to the um, development FDA approval. So if you look at it, it's a definitely a very long path with the multiple uh, aspects involved, starting with expert development to uh, in a, the, 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 the early discovery stages to development and a lot, and lot of time and money spent on the, dis, on the development side of things as well. So the process uh, I would say is uh, highly risky and it has go over a period of time, it has become uh, um, more efficient, but still it is still, uh, it's a highly risky process and a very expensive process. It's one in 10,000 make it to the market and it takes roughly 10, 12 to 15 years to, for a drug to make it to the market. So if you look at uh, the reasons why a lot of the drugs fail uh, in the market. Um, and I think a lot of the data came from Pfizer, if I'm right. So roughly 40% of the drugs do not make it to the market, although they go through a different phase, preclinical to clinical development, roughly 40% because of poor, I would say, pharmacokinetic properties. And I, I would like to call it more on the, you know, more delivery properties. When you say pharmacokinetics, you're obviously controlling the uh, drug disposition in the body. So a lot of this is, goes back to the delivery properties of the, of the molecule. So having had the background of the drug discount, so where do you start when you talk about designing a new delivery system? So, you know, looking at the uh, comprehensively, if you look at the way the design of delivery system, so, you know, of course, disease is very critical. Of course, if though the disease, of course, you don't have drugs and then the destination. So what I mean by destination is route administration. So definitely uh, there is a need as you look at, you know, when you talk about success rates and talk about uh, reducing these failures, it's important to look at all the three together in terms of what disease you're trying to treat, acute or chronic, the pathophysiology, of course, the type of patient population trying to treat, 
Of course, the drug plays a big part, uh, especially the physical properties, the biopharmaceutical pharmacokinetic properties, and the pharmacology property, pharmacology property of the drug. And then, in terms of drug delivery, this destination is a very, very important aspect as well. Where systemic are local, and you need to also take into consideration the biological barrier in each the route of administration, because that's a that's a that's a big barrier for getting drugs into the into the uh, system uh, circulation. If it's systemic, but also if you're talking about local, the local tissue as well. So this goes back to the fact that you know you can develop a delivery system and and retrofit drugs, but it's not a one size fits all. So you have to customize the delivery based on the disease, drug, and destination. So I'm going to show you a few examples along the way to show you the importance of the integrating these concepts. Not necessarily all of the examples integrate all the three, but at least there's one or two is predominant in each of these examples to give an idea for why it's important to take a look at comprehensive all three aspects of the uh, delivery uh, in designing a delivery system. So if you look at the um, the drug, so this is this is all the primary talks of the rare diseases. This is from NIH. So if you look at uh, one of the reasons uh, a lot of the drug delivery and there's a lot of interest in drug delivery is not only from a new drug discovery development, but also what I call is, what what is called as a drug repurposing, or in other words, also called reformulation. So even a drug which is uh, which cannot be delivered, I mean, as I said, you saw the 40% of the drugs do not make it in the markets because of the poor pharmacokinetic properties. You can improve some of the properties by using a proper delivery system. You know, even existing delivery system can be uh, put in a new drug. Uh, sorry, existing drug can put a new delivery system, and you can expand the ex and extend the patent life of the drug. Now, not only just for the from market standpoint, but also to improve the clinical efficacy and also reduce side effects. So if you really think about how many drugs really we have in the market, and there are roughly 3,500 drugs in the market for around 6,500 diseases. And I mean, interestingly enough, only 5% of the diseases actually have effective treatments, it was FDA approved treatments. Now, uh, the caveat here is of course, a lot of the disease, some of the diseases here covered are also rare diseases. In other words, disease which affect only 200,000 people, which means a small, patient population. So where really the big pharma, there is not much incentive for them to develop new drugs for that particular group of pop patient population because of a small number. So if you really think about developing uh, effective therapy of each of the diseases, it'll take around 2000 years or longer to develop a uh, effective therapy, the current rate at which we develop new drugs. But on the other hand, if you could uh, use a new delivery, ex you repurpose existing drugs by using a new delivery system by new route administration or even finding new indications for existing drugs. So drug repurpose is a big aspect of the developing new delivery systems. And as you'll see in some of the examples, how some of the delivery systems can really be the enabling technology to, to uh, overcome some of the challenges with some of the existing drugs. Now, this is uh, something we talked in the previous talk about the BCS classification system. So this talks about the type of drugs. So you can have, a, of course, we have a lot of large uh, molecules in the market. So the, the delivery challenge may be a little different. Of course, in large molecules, primarily permeability is an issue, short half-life, and majority of the drugs currently are given, the large protein molecules are given by parental route. Whereas uh, a lot of small molecules still can be delivered by oral route, of course, using the BCS paradigm where it is a, the drugs are classified based on the solubility and permeability. So we talk, going from high solubility to high permeability, very minimal challenges to the class four, which is, uh, uh, is really a big challenge delivered to the oral route. Now, in, in one of the things I forgot to mention, so the goal in any drug discount development is to develop an uh, oral, orally viable compound because it's the most convenient route administration and the more, more common and accepted route administration. Now, when you think about the destination, of course, the route administration, so you need to take into consideration the physiological barriers, but also it also limits how long you can deliver the drug. Obviously, for example, you know, buccal nasal, there's only limited, you can approve deliver the drug for 12 hours or so because of you know, keeping something in, in, the, in, in the mucosal tissues is, it can be quite challenging. Coperoral, when you talk about intestines, uh, you could deliver up to not more than once a day formulation. Although I'll, as I show some examples where this paradigm is being now revisited and there are some examples or some developments where people are able to deliver even uh, and drugs for an oral route for even for a month. Transdermal, of course, patches could be delivered, you know, again, and it's not necessarily all patches continuously administered for one week, but although you can theoretically you can do that, but uh, you can deliver the drug up to a week and, and a patch, inocular, uh, probably in a week, and some of the long acting can be implants can go longer as well. 
a lot of the parental formulations where you go for several months to a year so they may if you especially if you if talk about several years it's usually it's going to be some sort of non degradable system which can which need to be removed at the end of therapy so definitely the uh, delivery route has a big influence on how long you can deliver the drug so looking at the evolution of uh, drug delivery you know in in parallel with the evolution of the drug discovery development per se if you look at the you know we went from natural compounds to antibiotic which we talked about penicillins because then the lot of uh, competition modeling in the mid 1670s that's where a lot of the biochemistry uh, you know in pharmacology was was uh, pretty much driving the drug discovery development so then in the 80s as said is the biotech era we had a lot of uh, uh, protein based drugs and commercial uh, chemistry as well as high throughput screening and then of course we have recently uh, late night 90s and 2000 monoclonal antibodies and we are getting more and more of the biologics in the market and we are even talking about gene therapy as well now if we look at drug discovery development it is i would say it is uh, lately a uh, uh, 60 year old in terms of uh, the new delivery systems when i say new delivery system mainly sustain release control systems so till 1950s it is mostly conventional dosage forms which you know typically called as pills but then the coating process uh, the washer process came into the field where we are people are able to coat tablets and capsules to you know ex- exert some level of uh, sustain release of course the spansules which is a, the micro beads uh, with the uh, with the different coatings was the first sustain release uh, product to market which was introduced by smithkin beacon and then you have a lot of the depo preparation injectables which came in 1670s and then you have the the, the liposome which was uh, which is uh, which is it is a market expect doxel in the 1980 late 80s 90s and then you also have the, the even the 1970 80s you start there of what you call pulp polymer drug conjugates early stages of polymer drug conjugates and you had a lot of medical device come to the market drug drug related sense stents but if you look at 2000 beyond there's a lot of interest in delivering macromolecules not necessarily parallel parental but also oral route because not just all of them in the market but uh, there definitely a lot of advances have been made in those areas so when you talk about uh, drug delivery one thing what has happened over the period of time is also it's not only gone from uh, increase in uh, uh, decrease in size it's become smaller and smarter so able to multiple things with the with a single uh, delivery system so i use I'll often use the analogy of a computer so the what you see on the left hand side is actually the the first computer which used to occupy the size of a room now we can every, everything we can do it uh, in our in, in our in mobile mobile phones or smartphones so really things have become smaller but also you are able to do more and much smarter so same thing you can talk about drug delivery from you know uh, from crude way of drug delivery and delivery to much more precise drug delivery using microchips and other means including micro needles so we have become much smaller but also the delivery system has become smaller but also much smarter much more efficient so as as we understood more of the biology you know if you look at the so we initially we were more or most of the drugs are targeted at organ level so you know as a, on, a, on a corollary or parallel you can look at the drug delivery which look like macroscopic micro beads and then you, you know then it we are able to we went into the cellular level more of the microspheres and then if now we are talking about nano level at the more at a gene level which is more on the in the nano scale so as the as we understood more of the biology so the drug delivery has also evolved on the scale from a macroscopic to a more nanoscopic delivery systems to target the drugs more at a, at a, at a, at a molecular level or at a cellular level now this is a this is an this is an article from a, a, a kenam park uh, in the journal of control release so we talked about the how the uh, drug delivery system evolved over a period of time from 50s to the uh, 50s to the present to the future so the first generation of drug delivery systems primarily focused on how to control or sustain the drug release for example like the sustain release spansules transfer patches those all came within the period of 1950 to 80 now second generation was more uh, focused on what is called a smart delivery systems like my, my, most of the focus was on polymer based systems to uh, which can be triggered to certain stimuli like ph uh, or temperature or even enzymes for that matter where people have been even trying to deliver insulin for a long time but uh, it's not really uh, materialized into clinical reality so although the first generation lot of products in the market second generation has not had much success although the lot of hype around nanoparticles for example so if you look at nanotechnology and nanoparticle based systems if you look from 1990s uh, 90s to you know in the uh, 2015 is slightly older data here but but still the trend is still upward trajectory as you can see we went from a few publications to this is actually publication uh, uh, trajectory to several thousand publications in the last uh, 20 to 30 years 
and targeting is a big part of all of these publications. Now, although there is so much of uh, work has been done, but very few products are made, made to the market, partly because of our limited understanding of the biological barriers. Although we, we know how to uh, you know, design those systems from a material uh, science standpoint, but really we still lack the information how they really interact on a biological level. And so that's, so a lot of the in vitro studies have not really translated in, even more, in vivo into clinical reality, mainly because of our uh, limited understanding how they interact in the body. So, and the other thing also, when you look at the um, release kinetics, so earlier we went from immediate release to sustained release and even zero release. Although zero release is good and it, good in the sense that, you know, it's ideal uh, delivery system, but from a therapeutic standpoint, it doesn't really matter. The release kinetics, whether it's first order zero, doesn't matter as long as the drug levels are above the minimum effective concentration. So this we have learned over a period of time. The reason I bring this up because, you know, to achieve a zero release is much more difficult and also an expensive process. But you can achieve uh, sustained release lately easier with the, some of the existing technologies. So, so not necessarily every time you have, to have a zero release, you know, even a first shot slow, first shot would also still it would be able to achieve a therapeutic effect. Now, the, 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 the one of the things is you think about the release kinetics is also the fact that, uh, you know, in, in the parental depot preparations, one of the biggest challenge is how to control the burst release in the sense because in vitro it shows beautiful sustained release, zero order release, but in the body, although release may be zero order, but a lot of the process in the body still is first order. So it may not really translate on the zero order, may not really translate in the in vivo because of the biological barriers. Now, during the same time, as I said, you know, we went from macroscopic to nanoscopic delivery system. So not only we have, you know, five different systems, but also from a size standpoint, we are we able to attract a much smaller, small scale delivery systems. So, you know, the, as you think about the 3D paradigm, the other thing also uh, that drives the design new, new delivery system is the, what I call 3P paradigm, which is basically all of this need to translate in your clinical realities. A patient complains a big part of a lot of those things. Either it is uh, driven by the patient compliance or, you know, inconvenience of current uh, administration method or the delivery systems. Of course, the physicians, it's more of clinical need where certain diseases don't reduce side effects or for example, like cancer, you want target delivery to reduce a lot of the significant side effects. Of course, from a pharmaceutical scientist standpoint, you know, in, you know, a lot of the technologies come from the pharmaceuticals, and of course, this is talking about people side of things. Is a lot of the new technologies uh, come from there, but then it also need to integrate the patient needs and the and the clinical need. So really, there has to be a sync. I mean, when it's uh, for a for really a delivery uh, system to be clinically successful, so it's important to not to forget the the uh, patient side of things as well as the clinical need. In, before designing a new delivery system. So as you think about 3D approach, so if you look at how the new delivery systems evolved a period of time, so either a drug, then what, it, what is called as the market pull approach, what it means is basically there's a drug, the delivery system serves an enabling technology. For example, you, know, you can think of, uh, you know, as an example is Paclitaxel. So Taxol is a drug that is uh, anti-cancer drug used for breast cancer and other cancers. So when the Taxol was first into the market, uh, it was a, it was a, it is a very insoluble compound. But in order to, although it's very effective, so in order to bring it to the market, so they basically had to use a very um, toxic excipient called Cremo for EL. So the Cremo for the one of the challenges Cremo for EL is uh, we have to give a lot of pre medication to avoid the side effect not of the drug but for the excipient. So that that's dose limiting toxicity because of the excipient uh, than uh, compared to the drug. So, but uh, with the with the uh, develop, so that there is a strong clinical need to develop an effective delivery system, which has divided some of the side effects of the excipient. So, in, in 2005, 2006, uh, the albumin-bound paclitaxel came to the market. So, right away, it, it captured a big market of 300 million dollars. The, re the reason it was able to do that is because one albumin is a natural uh, compound, but also the fact that uh, it is water soluble, and also the fact that you can you don't have the dose limit toxicity or the pre medication you have to give with the taxol. So, that is one example where the the drug is pushing the technology. And in most cases, it could be the technology which would uh, drive the uh, drug and the uh, you know, disease that they're looking at. For example, 3D printing. So currently the 3D printing is, 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 you know, is, a, is a hot area that people are working on because of the ability to print different dosage from different release kinetics and so on and so forth. So the technology can then drive, a lot of the drugs can go into the technology. So, so it can be a market pull approach, a technology pull approach, but still, it's still a 3D still plays a big part in, in, in either of these approaches. Of course, as I said, you know, again, market forces, what I mean by market forces is mostly patent expiry, extending the patent, 
clinical need is a big driver. Of course, then the patient compliance is also a big driver of uh, new drug to the systems. So I often like to call the, it is the ability to start as a, the, this different abilities, solubility, permeability, stability, deliverability, manufacturing, and bioavailability. So pretty much pharmaceutics aspects either address one or more of these aspects to really get a drug into your medicine, in other words, into your, to enable into your clinical product. So of course, we, you know, we consider the physical, physical pharmaceutical aspect, the biopharmaceutical as well as the pharmacokinetics of the, of the drug. So taking the, uh, the, all of these things, three decent approach. So obviously the, here's the drug, it could be macromolecule, small molecule. Then of course the material science is the important part of the design and the release mechanism. So traditionally this, most of them have been based on the diffusion dissolution. Although ion exchange osmosis is kind of a, 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 a different mechanism, but still they pretty much rely on the diffusion dissolution to most part, the most, most part of its, uh, its performance in the body. So, and then you're talking about the drug loop system, again, you can talk about the scale from macro to micro to nano. And then the release kinetics also matter because for example, some of the protein uh, where you, you, know, you may not want a constant drug release, but more of pulse dead drug release. Of course, a big part of the development is the in between wave correlation. And that is where a lot of the new delivery systems, especially nanoparticles have really failed because a lot of them work very, very good or, you know, in, in preclinical models, but really don't translate in vivo. So that's a big challenge in terms of trans some of the uh, nano medicines. Of course, pharmacokinetics is a big part of it. Of course, then, you know, the, the routes administration, depending on the route administration, the, design, the dosage form has to match the route administration. And then which, which can eventually, taking all of this concentration as you develop the drug into your clinical application or, or the delivery system, the clinical application. So if you look at the different routes administration, still oral route is the uh, roughly 40% of the current dosage uh, products in the market are delivered orally. One, because it's convenient to administer easy to manufacture, and there are uh, already technologies out there, which is a proven technology. So majority of the drugs are given by oral route. So most of my discussion is primarily focused on the oral route for this, for this, this, for this reason. I'm just checking the chat to see this. Okay, so in terms of oral route, of course, you know, the, the oral route, when you talk about oral route, talk all the way from the oral cavity uh, right to the colon. So definitely there's a different physiology, different barriers. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, each of those aspects of the, uh, the oral route, right? Starting from the mouth to the colon. So here, if you look at it, one is the, the for example, the jejunum or the stomach, the, the, the physio physi physiology barrier is very different come from a small intestine compared to the large intestine. The pH is varying all the way from acidic, highly acidic to alkaline range. And then you have the transit time how long the drug stays in the different sections of the GA tract from very short transit time in the stomach, much longer transit in the colon. I think I have some disturbance. Uh, please can mute your microphone. Dr. Kumar, Dr. Sunil, you may, may want to please uh, mute the microphone. Yeah, yeah, we, we have heard that. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So then, then the thing about the mucus, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot more mucus secretion in the stomach compared to the other parts of the GA tract. Now, as you as you'll, you'll you'll see why I'm talking about this because as you go into some of the technologies, this the difference in physiology can be used. One, it could be a barrier, but also you can use it to advantage. We really understand the physiology aspect, the destination of the barriers that posed by the different aspects of the GA tract. And then the, there's a big aspect which is really getting a lot of attention lately is the microbiome in the colon. And now even there are therapies that are directed towards the microbiome. So I'll talk about an example towards the end of this uh, presentation. So, so there is definitely varying physiology, varying physical properties that they need, to, physical, physical aspects that they need to be considered. So in the design of the uh, delivery system. So, but for most part, all of these factors can be divided to one is the drug properties, which is the drug physical properties. And then what I call the physiological parameters, which is primarily, uh, primarily focused on the, the barriers. So, more or less the fixed law of diffusion, which is pretty much governs all aspects of uh, drug delivery in different routes administration. Pretty much all of the things are captured directly or indirectly in this simple equation, where the rate of absorption is, uh, you know, depend on the diffusion coefficient of the drug, which is primarily depend on the size of the molecule to partly also the membrane properties, the, um, the surface area that's pr provided by both the dosage form, but also the, the different sections of GA tract. For example, in the intestine, you have villi, which, in which obviously significantly increases the surface area, which you don't have in the stomach or in the colon. And the partition coefficient is a, the log P of the drug is a pretty big determinant of uh, drug permeation. 
of course, the biggest driving force in fixed life is the drug constant gradient. And the thickness of the membrane, of course, we're talking about a physiological barrier here, so which also has an influence on the drug transport. So pretty much all of these factors are directly or indirectly influence the drug absorption and, in, and also uh, which is need to be considered in the design of a appropriate delivery system or dosage form. So in, in a simplest sense, if you look at the uh, plasma count time profile, so there's some of the aspects of the, once the drug gets in the blood, of course, you have the C-max, the maximum constant, the time reach maximum concentration, the elimination rate constant, the absorption rate constant. But once the drug gets the blood, it's very difficult for, it to, for us to control. But a lot of our efforts in, uh, in drug delivery and drug formulations really focus on the left side, left -hand side of this curve. So what are you trying to modulate or uh, optimize? You're basically trying to optimize this left-hand side of the, uh, this curve, either to alter the, I mean, mainly to alter the solubility or permeability or both, and a result you know, control the absorption of the drug into systemic circulation. Of course, if the absorption is low, you want to increase it, but in some cases, control is you basically want to slow down the absorption and make the release rate such a way that is much lower than absorption for, for the drug to be sustained or controlled for prolonged periods. So if you think about what is really controlled or sustained and control release formulation, it's really the uh, release rate. So really what you're trying to do is you are, you know, basically flattening the curve from a, from a peak concentration, much more slower drug release. So in a, in a traditional dosage form, you have the dosage form releasing the drug and then goes to the absorption pool and then the drug is absorbed in the solution state uh, into the systemic circulation. Now, in a, if you really design the delivery system in a proper way and sustain the control is formulation, you basically take the control from the body to the, to the system, in other words, the release rate. So when you make the release rate much, much, much slower than the absorption rate, so what will happen is the release rate pretty much uh, becomes the rate of not the absorption rate. In other words, you can pretty much control the absorption indirectly by controlling the release rate. As a result, you're able to sustain or control the drug levels in the body. So this is pretty much the core of all of the, uh, you know, design of all uh, oral control sustainability systems. So you can achieve a slow first order release, you can achieve a zero order release, and typically most of the sustainable control is dosage forms have a, a priming dose and a maintenance dose. So it can be released in different fashion. You can have slow, fast first order and followed by slow first order, or a fast first order followed by a zero order release. So there are different designs, uh, different types of release depend on uh, design of the delivery system. Similarly, if you look at the plasma constant time profile, so the priming dose or the initial dose and the, and the maintenance dose, both can release simultaneously at, of course, two different rates. So the green curve, what you see is the cumulative uh, aspect of both the uh, immediate release dosage form as well as the maintenance dose. In other words, prime, prime, priming dose and maintenance dose together. Or it can be designed such a way that the primary, pr priming dose released, and when the most of it's released, then you, you, you delay the release of the maintenance dose. So to maintain it, so the top curve actually shows more slow first order release. The bottom curve basically shows the same thing in a zero order release, much a little more flatter than the, the first order, slow first order release. So you can, so you get the priming dose to get the concentration up in the plasma, and then you want to maintain it by a slow release of the core. So you can do in a core shell uh, fashion where the internal core releases slowly, but the outer shell of the, the, the delivery system releases the drug faster to reach the levels right away after administration. So, if you look at all of the designs of the delivery systems, you know, the, the control system, they fall in one of these four categories broadly. So majority of the system already find the market is matrix and monolith systems. And uh, I, I usually use the analogy of, uh, of a pizza as a for matrix system. So in other words, the drug and the polymer are interdisposed in a, in a single matrix. Whereas in membrane system, what you see is uh, uh, the drug is separately separate from the uh, rate controlling membrane. So more or less like a burger. So where you have the drug in the middle and they have a rate controlling membrane. Now the third as system is actually a modified membrane release system where osmotic pressure is used as a way to control the drug release. The ionic chain system is more based as the name indicates made as an ionic change, uh, changing one of the ions for the endogenous ion to release the drug. And in all the system, there is varying degree of diffusion or dissolution involved. So depending on which is predominating, it can be dissolution control or diffusion control system. And as I said earlier, so some of the systems may contain a, a immediate release aspect of the uh, middle is part of the dose, uh, the drug, the outer core, for example, in a, in a, in a membrane control systems, so which can release the drug immediately, followed by slow release of the core for the maintenance dose. And again, this can be most of them, although they are solid dosage form, but they can also be liquid dosage form, especially dianetic systems. There are some liquid dosage form in the market. So, so I'm going to talk about a few examples from each of those uh, different uh, routes from the, from the oral cavity to all the way to the colon. 
uh, uh, starting a buckle. And I'm not going to show exhaustive list, but I'll show you a few examples, which are advances are, uh, are, are, are some examples where the 3D aspects come into play, either the drug, disease, or destination. In mostly, most of the examples talk about the destination where some of the biological barriers can be overcome by using uh, an intelligent design of the drug delivery system. So first to talk about the buckle. So the buckle oral cavity is uh, primarily focused either the drug is absorbed through the buckle tissue or the sublingual. Of course, sublingual is highly vascularized, so it's rapid uh, for rapid delivery. Whereas buckle can is, is, I would say the buckle permeability is somewhere between the um, skin and the uh, intestinal mucosa. Skin is much more, uh, 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 much more less permeable compared to the buccal mucosa, but of course buccal mucosa is more permeable to the skin, but less, per less permeation compared to the intestine because intestine is a lot more villi, which affords more surface area for absorption. Now the, the, the similarity between skin and buccal mucosa is the fact that there is, uh, the, of course in skin they have the keratin, so in the oral cavity, except the palatal membrane, palatal membrane is the roof of the mouth, as well as the gingiva, which is the gums, the rest of the uh, tissue in the oral cavity does not have keratin. In, in other words, it's not keratinized. So the absorption is much better to the buccal mucosa compared to the roof of the mouth or the, to the uh, gums, but, but sublingual all, again, it does not have a keratinized tissue. But the tongue is kind of a mixture of keratin and non-keratinized tissue, which is very limited, very limited use for drug delivery. So for rapid onset, typically most of them sublingual, but for slow release, sustained release, you can use actually the buccal uh, route for administration. So I'm going to show you a few examples, uh, but before I do that, these are some of the dosage from already in the market. In fact, this is historically, it came from the first uh, um, axonal um, uh, finding that the sublingual can be used to use angina pectoris for, uh, for the cardiac arrest by using nitroglycerin. So by a physician called William Farrell in 1800s, so by, 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 ch by chance, he found that the, the, when the patient took a solution of nitroglycerin under the tongue, it was rapidly absorbed. So that's why they first they discovered that sublingual could be out of drug administration. In fact, we even have an a, a insulin spray, buckle spray, but uh, it's, I think it's in the Korean market in, in Japan and, and few European countries, but not in the United States. So there is even some micromolecules to be delivered by the, in the oral cavity. So the example that I want to show is, this is an example where is the technology push. So this is the ODT, which is the oral dissolving tablet. So here, so this is the first uh, 3D printed uh, formulations uh, ever introduced in the market. It's introduced in 2016. It's uh, for a drug called Lev Levotracetam, which is an anti-epileptic drug. So it's a rapidly dissolving tablet. So one advantage of ODT is oral dissolving tablets, you don't need water. And it's also good for pediatric and geriatric and even for adults, um, you know, even adults, uh, 30 to 40 percent adults have swallowing difficulties. So definitely this is an, uh, what it is, is giving more and more popular, a lot more products coming to the market. But the nice thing about this particular technology is able to customize different sizes, shapes, different doses for different uh, patients, uh, from pediatric to geriatric to adult patients. So there'll be a lot of innovations happening in this because of the uh, uh, advances in the printing technology, especially inkjet printing and other powder centering technologies. So uh, instead of me talking about the technology, I'm going to show you a video, uh, which is again from the company website uh, for the spur term. So this is, a, this is the only product that's approved right now, but there are a lot more uh, developments happening and, and, and uh, hopefully we'll have more products in the, in the near future, which are 3D printed, uh, especially in the world uh, dosage forms. So I'm going to start the video, so. <laughs> Introducing ZipDose technology, the first and only drug formulation platform to utilize 3D printing. This proprietary technology allows disintegration in seconds with just a sip of liquid, taking the oral medication experience to a whole new dimension. Let's see how 3D printing takes shape. Medications are formed by a layering process. First, a powdered pharmaceutical blend is deposited on a single layer. Then, a binding fluid is precisely deposited to bind the powder blend and prepare it to adhere to the next layer. This process is repeated several times. The result is a solid yet highly porous oral dispersible medication. Zip-dose technology enables high-dose loading of up to 1,000 milligrams, a wide range of taste masking capabilities, and rapid disintegration in seconds with a sip of liquid. 
Let's take a closer look. When liquid is added or sipped, the bonds break apart, allowing thorough disintegration for ease of swallowing. So the other example I want to show you here is the buccal uh, dosage form. So there have been a lot of interest in mucoid dosage forms to retain the drug in the oral cavity for at least six to 12 hours for sustained drug release. So there have been, uh, you know, first generation, second generation, third generation. So the first generation was a mainly mucoid polymer based tablets, for example, as you can see here, one of the challenges here is, you know, again, uh, the drug is released from all directions, not only the direction where the, the tablet is, uh, you know, facing the mucosal tissue, but also the other opposite direction. So there's a lot of drug loss. So the goal here is to maximize the drug absorption in the oral cavity. So there is a lot of drug loss in the first generation. So the second generation had a semi membrane on one side. That means the drug can only release from the, 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 the side which is facing the mucosal tissue, not the other side. But the challenge with this one was it's a non degal polymer. So in other words, after the therapy, you have to remove the filling from the buccal tissue or the gingival tissue. Although buccal people also can be also used on the uh, lips or on the uh, gums or on the buccal. Now, third generation, which I'm going to show an example, is a bio system. So here, the, the backing membrane, which does not allow the drug to you know, flow in the other direction, it allows one of the drug to flow in the direction which uh, faces the mucosal tissue. So you don't have to remove this. It's basically dissolves by up slowly. So it's bio so you don't have to worry about uh, the drug being, uh, the, the patch being removed from the oral cavity. So this is a, an advancement where you are using, using the technology to maximize the absorption of the destination. In this case, the, of course, the buccal tissue. So I'm going to show an example of Onsalis, which is a fentanyl buccal patch. So I'm going to show this video here quickly here. An important innovation in drug delivery technology, BIMA. The advanced technology in BIMA, bioerodible mucoadhesive film, allows it to adhere to the buccal mucosa, the mucous membrane of the cheek. Here's how the novel BIMA bilayer buccal film works. The backing layer helps the medication flow to the cheek's mucous membrane and not back into the mouth to be swallowed. The dose of medication is printed on the mucoadhesive side to differentiate it from the backing layer. The mucoadhesive layer contains a dose of pre-dissolved medication. Its design allows it to adhere quickly to the inside of the cheek. Bima buckle film adheres within seconds. Once it adheres, there's no need to continue holding it in place. It'll dissolve completely. Saliva moistens the mucoadhesive layer, causing it to adhere. The mucoadhesive layer bonds with the mucous membrane, keeping the buccal film in place. Then the medication is released. The backing layer helps facilitate one-way flow. So the medication is able to penetrate the mucous membrane and flow into the cheek's blood vessels. Now that the medication has entered the bloodstream, it is carried throughout the body by the circulatory system. The convenient BEMA drug delivery technology allows for speaking and swallowing normally as the medication is delivered and the film dissolves. Hey, how you doing? BEMA technology provides rapid drug delivery and efficient absorption and is easy to use. Okay, I'll be right there. The advancements in BEMA buccal film technology can usher in the next generation of treatment. BEMA is designed with patients in mind. An important innovation so again, this is, you know, this is again, coming back to the patient aspect, that's an important aspect as a design new delivery system. So now I'm going to sl uh, and slide to switch gears and talk about uh, protein delivery. And, and this is not in the market yet, but it's a very interesting uh, uh, development or it's just something that's advancing. So, you know, we might see something in the future uh, where protein, even protein drugs like insulin or human growth can, can be delivered to the buccal tissue. So here, what they used is a, what is called as a dissolved microneedles. Um, so this basically microneedles is micron such needles, obviously as the name indicates. So you can't see by an, an, a naked eye, it just looks like small spots, but actually it's a micron such needle of 10 micron or one micron, 10 micron length, less than 10, less than 10 micron length, but also diameter is around one micron or so. So what you see in this figure is actually is a Fitzy labeled, fluorescent labeled to show the tip of the microneedles. So the tips are coated with the drug and then they insert it like a patch, like similar patch what you saw in the previous example and it's put in the buccal tissue to en enhance the penetration of macromolecules. So as I indicated in the earlier slides that macromolecules do not cross the membrane. So this is a way to increase the permeation by using the physical mechanism. Of course, 
this is how they coat. So basically, it's a, it's a, the drug is loaded here and then centrifuged, and it's and again all of this is a, uh, bioerodible. In other words, they are made of sugar uh, molecules. So basically, it's a dissolvable. And then once you once the drugs release, it slowly dissolves, and then you don't have to think about removing it. So so they use this in showed in at least in a, in a in a pig model. So I'll not go into details. Basically, they put in different as different sites of the uh, the palatal membrane. They put in the sublingual. They put in the buccal. What they found was the sub. This is basically insulin, as you can see. Compared to subcutaneous, the buccal patch was able to produce uh, blood glucose reduction in the in the pigs as closest to subcutaneous uh, uh, insulin uh, delivery. So they found the buccal and the palatal membrane. Palatal is the one on the roof of the mouth are more convenient for drug delivery compared because it's a solid microneedle, so it might be much more uh, better tissue to deliver as opposed to sublingually. So this is a study they did in 100 human volunteers. So this is a human volunteer study. They applied on the skin. As you can see, this is the palatal membrane. This is the roof of the mouth and cheek, which is a, this is a, a buckle, and the lips and the tongue and different, different sites to see how much force is required to apply this. And then the VA score is basically a visual analog score, pain score for the different volunteers. So the 100 volunteers, they scored in a scale of zero to 10, zero being the least painful, 10 being the uh, most painful. So they also had a base plate that means as a, as a control with no micro needles, so to compare the pain. So as you can see, the skin uh, there was of course you know with the micro needles pain was more compared to just a blank uh, patch without the micro needles. Of course, uh, lip and tongue and sublingual is more painful compared to the palatal, which is the roof of the mouth and the and the buccal. So they basically found that uh, uh, this were this is more appropriate uh, route for administration. So in fact, they asked the patients to, or, or sorry, I shouldn't say patient, volunteer, human volunteers to rank the pain, would they prefer an injection versus this, this type of microneedle in the buckle? Most of them said they would prefer this microneedle over an injection uh, because it's, uh, it's less painful than a regular injection. And around 43 or 40, I would say 49, 43% of people preferred uh, the, uh, the microneedles to be applied in the uh, buckle or in the palatal membrane, not on the other sides of the mucosal tissue. So basically what the study shows is the one's acceptability of the patient, because that's important as you develop new technologies, because they all look nice, but again, you want to make sure they're safe. And pretty much in the pig model, they found this, even the human, they found within 20, 20 minutes, this, uh, this whole space will reseal. So really it's, it's not uh, that invasive because it doesn't penetrate deep into the tissue. So it, practically they, they are sealed back. So there's, there's really very less concern of any adverse effects. Of course, there's a clinical trial. There's no product in the market yet, but I just wanted to show the the possibility of delivering uh, macromolecules to the back buccal tissue. So moving along the uh, oral route, so let me go to the gastrointestinal system in the stomach. Now, uh, as I said, stomach things only stay for one to two hours, and there's also a physiological system which clears things from the stomach. So there is what is called as a micro migrate, migrating myelotic complex. This is basically called housekeeping waves. To this only happens between the meals. So it starts with a small peristaltic movement with the intense peristaltic movement, basically to push all the residual food material from the stomach to the duodenum and to the small intestine. Now, if you really think about, you know, between the meal, between the morning and the afternoon, if you, if you, if you, if you hear a gurgling sound or the, uh, the uh, you know, uh, a gurgling sound in the stomach, that is because this microelectric micro, micro, micro complex is happening. It repeats every 90 minutes. Once you take, start taking food, it immediately will stop because to aid the digestion. So this is mainly a clearing uh, mechanism to clear things from the stomach to the uh, duodenum to the small intestine, which means the reason it is important is if you want to retain something in the stomach for longer periods, a system should be able to withstand this uh, this my, uh, MMC complex. Otherwise, it is going to the peristaltic movement is going to push it out. The other interesting thing is you think about the physiology again. Understand the destination. There's a pyloric sphincter is only uh, approximately two centimeter in diameter, so there's a narrow sphincter. So the reason I brought, bring this up is if you really develop a system which can change its shape once in the stomach, then it will be retained in the stomach for longer periods to enhance absorption. So the question is, why do you want to deliver the drugs from the stomach? There are drugs, for example, like uh, weakly acidic drugs, as we know from physical pharmacy, weakly acidic drugs are anionized and acidic pH. They absorb better in the stomach. Normally, they don't stay in the stomach for more than two hours, but if you can have a way to make them stay, then you can ensure better absorption. Our drugs with poor solubility in alkaline pH in the intestine. Our drugs with this, uh, narrow absorption window. For example, like uh, gabapentin. Gabapentin is a receptor in the right of the duodenum. Of course, in a normal dosage form, immediately goes to duodenum, doesn't stay long. But if you retain something in the stomach, the drug release from the stomach can also be absorbed from the duodenum. There is only specific transporters for gabapentin, only the duodenum, highly expressed. 
So you want really maximize absorption in the drug in the stomach. So people are trying to uh, retain the drug in the uh, stomach. Of course, you have to overcome the limited GA transit time. So that is where the design of the delivery system come into play. So people have designed system which can uh, uh, less dense to make it to float. So something floats, it's not clear from the stomach uh, during the peristaltic movement, or you can make it very dense, like using some heavy ion particles to sediment. Of course, this is not made in the market, but uh, basically it's, uh, it, it is an experimental therapy. But a lot of the products that made in the market, like the Saffron, uh, Saffron, Saffron's, uh, floating delivery system is based on the low density polymer, which can float in the gas, uh, gastrointestinal system. So it can deliver the drug up to 10, 12 hours. Or you can make mucoidacy uh, formula, which can address the mucus in the stomach. So you can have four ways, increase density, decrease density, or use mucoidacive, or you can use system which can swell or change its shape. That means size is so large, it cannot go through the pyloric sphincter. So retain the drug in the stomach. So the, the, the one of the swelling system is a Glumetsa, which is a anti-diabetic metformin drug, which is delivered for, it's a weakly acidic drug, it's absorbed better in the stomach. It's, they use this technology to sustain the drug release from the stomach. So I'm going to show you again here an example. So for example, if you have a swellable polymer, so in the acidic pH of the stomach, it swells, as you can see, three or four times it can swell, depending on what type polymer is used. And after most of the drugs release, then eventually this will shrink and then uh, eliminate it through the spiral sphincter. Now, a lot of the uh, innovations have been happening in more to alter the shape of the system. For example, like foldable or un system which can unfold. For example, like a, like a sheet, which is comes out of the capsule and then folds, uh, unfolds and then because it's unfolded, now it cannot go to the pyloric sphincter, release a drug for a period of time, this pre -dis pre different time. And then once uh, it releases a drug, it's degraded and it's again cleared from the stomach. So there are a lot of patterns around different shapes. What is the appropriate shape to retain the drug in the stomach? But I'm going to show you a few examples. So the one I just mentioned about the GAB pentin. So I'm going to show an example where they use this, uh, what they call the depot form technology to make a swellable system to retain the drug in the stomach and to release the drug and you know make the drug absorbed from the duodenum where most of the drugs are absorbed for GAB pentin. So I'm going to play this video. The AccuForm delivery technology is based on the proprietary use of polymers or connector molecules, which are blended with Depomed's target drug compounds to produce oral tablets. These polymers, which have a history of use in the food and cosmetics industries, are uniquely applied by Depomed to create a tablet that, once ingested and in the stomach, becomes a gel-like substance. The polymer mixtures are custom designed based on the desired delivery profile that will result in efficacy as well as a side effect advantage for a drug compound. Once the tablet is taken, it transits to the stomach, similar to other oral medications. Within the stomach, however, the AccuForm delivery system behaves uniquely and becomes a gel-like substance that prevents the drug from passing too quickly through the gastrointestinal tract. An AccuForm tablet is retained in the stomach for a number of hours while it continuously releases the incorporated drug at a controlled rate to optimal absorption sites in the upper intestine. This slow, controlled release of drug is preferred over immediate release formulations in which the drug is essentially dumped in the stomach, which often causes a disturbance in the gastrointestinal system and frequent drug side effects. By extending the tablet retention time with AccuForm, there is improved drug absorption better bioavailability of drug, and maintenance of constant drug levels in the circulatory system. Importantly, by prolonging the release of drug and preventing dose dumping, drug side effects may be reduced. Once drug delivery is complete, the tablet dissolves and is safely excreted. So the, AccuForm so the next one I'm going to show you is that, that one was based on the uh, size of the design the system. This is based on the shape of the system. And this, is one, this one is not in the market yet.
So the next one I'm going to show is, a, I would say, a little recent. This is uh, came out of work from MIT uh, in Bob Langer's lab. So this one is a very interesting study. If you remember, I said, you know, most of the uh, oral doses from not more than once a day. This is the first example where they showed, at least in the pig model, that you can deliver the drug even for 10 days, they just by eating the drug in the stomach. So what they did was a very uh, innovative, creative polymeric system. So again, unfolds, but it's like a star-shaped system. As you can see, it's a regular, looks like a regular capsule, but has five arms, for example. So they're made of non degradable polymer in the center, and then the arms are also non degradable but they have some cleavable linkers. So the drug, the interesting about this, in each arm you can have different loading of drug, same drug, or different types of drugs. So you can have multi-drug therapy with a single dosage form. So they're designed to slow release, for example, after a predetermined time, the arms come off. So initially, because the star shape, they retain in the stomach, but after over a period of time, it slowly releases, the arms are cleaved by the, by the hydrolytic cleavage in the stomach. And then these arms are all, again, goes to the intestine and they're exited in the feces. So it's not degradable per se, with the cleavable linker. So eventually it's all exited in the feces. So this is a study where they did in the peaks, for example, they, with the ivermectin, a drug, which is a anthelmintic drug, so that's why it's yellow. So you can see even this in the pig stomach, it is retained for almost 10 days. So they've done different studies with the different arms, the plasma time profile compared to the conventional ivermectin, they're able to read in the, uh, release the drug for almost 10 days, just in stomach. The first time it demonstrated you can deliver drug for a week or even longer from the oral cavity. And they re most recently they have developed oral contraceptive. So currently oral contraceptives are taken every day for 21 days uh, based on the, the ovulation cycle women. So the compliance is a big problem. So they were able to use the Starship system uh, and demonstrate, again, this was in the peaks, they're able to demonstrate that you can release a drug almost for 21 days, three weeks from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the stomach. So the conventional, first perhaps is a conventional, uh, uh, just which is a contraceptive, for, it can remain in the levels up to two days, whereas this is a, a different coating of the polymer, which can release up 20 days, and then with a different coating of the polymer on the, on the arms, they're able to, again, deliver almost 21 days. So this picture shows the uh, peaks from zero, day zero to zero 29. And if you can see, they are, have X-ray contrast medium. So you can see the arms, the star-shaped dotted arms is still staying in the stomach for almost till, uh, almost a month. So this is very it's unheard of in uh, oral delivery. So the closest you can get to this 21 days or month is actually implants, parental implants. So this is the first time they've demonstrated at least a pig model that you're able to deliver a drug, like for example, like oral contraceptive almost for, for, a, for a month. So this, uh, this, this video just shows you how the system works. So I might stop halfway through depending on um, you know, um, time. So I, I might, but just wanted to show the, how the system works. This is an anti-HIV drug, four different drugs they're able to show in the spine model, in the pig model. One of the major advances in the treatment of HIV infection has been the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. Antiretrovirals have an incredible capacity to reduce HIV-related deaths when patients take the medication regularly. Antiretrovirals are also used in those who are at risk of exposure to HIV for prevention, often referred to as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. When subjects take antiretrovirals, they're able to protect themselves against HIV infection, as demonstrated in several clinical trials. One of the major challenges, though, is that these medications need to be taken daily. Studies have consistently shown that 20% to 30% of medication prescriptions are never filled, and that approximately 50% of medications for chronic disease are not taken as prescribed. In different studies conducted all over the world, many individuals do not manage to take their medication on a regular basis, and often subjects are found to have drug levels in their blood which are much lower than expected if they were taking their pills as prescribed. Several research groups around the world are trying to tackle this problem by developing implants like vaginal rings that can release drugs slowly over prolonged time periods or long-lasting injectable drugs. We decided to take a completely different approach. Since swallowing pills is so much easier than getting an injection or implant, our goal has been to develop a new type of pill that would dramatically reduce how often someone needs to take their HIV drugs. You can't change the patient, but you can change the drug delivery system. We started by transforming the capsule to maximize ease and dosing. We have developed a capsule in the form of a star with six arms. Each arm can be loaded with a different formulation. 
or even a different drug and provide extended drug coverage or drug release. We optimize the system to reside in the stomach and remain stable for at least a week. We then identified a set of antiretrovirals that are potent enough to work with our system. These include dolutegravir, rilpivirine, and cabotegravir. We developed novel formulations of these three drugs and demonstrated the ability to release them over the course of seven days, initially in vitro, and then in vivo in a pig animal model. This system is also demonstrated to be quite safe to remain in the stomach for long durations. To understand the potential real-world impact of this system, we collaborated. I'm going to stop here. One. So the next system I'm going to show is the osmotic system, and many of you may be aware of this. So here, basically, the you know based on osmotic agent or either drug or an excipient that it can draw water into it, and then it's go to the semi membrane. And then drug can only get out of this, what is called a narrow laser drilled hole. So the drug, water can enter, but the drug can only get out of this. So you can get precise control drug delivery with the osmotic systems. And this is, I would say, absolute zero order you can achieve this. And it's also a versatile system because you can, you can have different types of drugs uh, in different, the different solubility. So instead of having one core, you can have a drug, separate drug core and osmotic agent. So it's like a push-pull system so that water gets in and then the osmotic uh, thing expands and then pushes the drug out of the orifice. So we have several products in the market like Provera, Procardio, which is for a, a propranolol uh, for a antiprotensive drug, Covera HS for nifedipine again, and antiprotensive drug. And they have also developed liquid dosage forms with multiple units and so on and so forth. So, so I'm going to show where they have been able to, and again, you have multiple openings, can have three layer tablets with the two drugs at two different on the top and the bottom, and then a central osmotic core. I'm going to show an example of methylphenidate, which is a drug used for ADHD for children. Now, in ADHD, it's, come, it's more of attention deficit disorder. People get restless and they don't focus on things. So you need to maintain the methylphenidate levels, which increase the dopamine levels to uh, improve the symptoms of uh, ADHD. So, but the release has to pattern, has to mimic the um, symptoms of the disease. So they use the osmotic agent in a concert uh, tablet to basically the osmotic system to really release, uh, mimic the release to match the symptoms of the disease. So I'm going to show uh, this video here quickly. Each tablet is covered with an overcoat containing 22% of the total methylphenidate dose. When the tablet is swallowed, this drug overcoat dissolves quickly, giving a rapid initial release of the drug, similar to standard immediate release formulations. Beneath the drug overcoat is a semi-permeable membrane that absorbs water by osmosis at a controlled rate. The interior of the tablet is divided into three compartments. As water is absorbed, the push compartment expands. Methylphenidate is pushed out of the first low concentration compartment through a precisely engineered laser drilled hole. As more water is absorbed, some of the drug in the low concentration compartment mixes with the drug in the second high concentration compartment. So around midday, after a morning dose, methylphenidate is released at intermediate concentrations. Finally, the drug from the high concentration compartment is released at a controlled rate. So, looking at the plasma concentration, the initial release from the outer coat causes a rapid rise in the plasma level, ensuring quick onset of action. This level is maintained by release from the first low concentration compartment. And as the concentration of drug release rises, so does the plasma concentration. The ascending pharmacokinetic profile of Concerta XL comes close to that of the ideal profile we saw earlier. Standard immediate release methylphenidate has to be taken three times a day to be effective for 12 hours. Concerta XL has a similar rapid onset of action, but the pharmacokinetic profile bisects the peaks and troughs of standard methylphenidate, and one dose gives a similar 12 hour duration of effect. So the finally, we talk, want to talk about oral protein delivery. So similar to the buckle. So here, um, they use a micro needle to deliver the drug to the stomach. Again, it's pretty, uh, I think one or two years old 
work, but again, some of the studies have been done in the main in pigs, but there is also a recent study in humans. So really they got the inspiration from a tortoise basically because once you have, so what did the system has is, is like, looks like capsule here, as you can see, it's just mini small beads based on, based on polycaprolactone and there's stainless steel micro needle on the bottom. So they found different shapes and this is the best shape which can withstand the peristaltic movement of the intestine and stomach. So as you can see in this picture, there's a micro needle. It's, it is not degradable. So it is coated with the drug, primarily in this case, insulin. So it, once it goes in the body, there is a coating which dissolves. And then there's, a, there's an internal spring in the system. And the spring expands, the micro needle actually hits into the, in the uh, mucosal tissue in stomach. So stomach is a little bit thicker than the intestine. So it, it, there's not much pain receptors. So it does, really doesn't cause pain. It only you know, uh, penetrates the, 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 the first few layers of the stomach lining to really the coating dissolves pretty fast within an hour or so, it's, it's more, like, more like injection in the stomach and dissolves. And then once the drug is released, then a predetermined time, then it is actually cleared from the stomach. Uh, from the stomach, of course, you know, size is small enough, it can pass through the spiral sphincter into the small intestine and is cleared out of the intestine in the feces. Now, the device, what they found was inspiration from the tortoise where actually because of the, uh, the peristaltic movement, things can tilt. So because of the angle at which it is there, so it will straighten it up and it will still be able to get penetrated into the stomach. So they have used this mechanism and they've shown histologically, you know, and then it's most of the ceiling actually, uh, people are able to, they have, there's not much significant side of it. They're able to recover, the tissue is able to recover within, uh, within a few hours. And they actually uh, demonstrated the delivery of insulin using this and they're able to get us almost similar to subcutaneous injection of insulin. So this is the picture of the pig with the um, microneural based oral delivery system. So I'll display this video here quickly. Diabetes mellitus affects over 30 million Americans and 415 million people worldwide. Individuals with diabetes either do not generate sufficient insulin, are unable to use insulin properly, or experience both issues. Diabetes results in high blood sugar levels, which in turn can lead to serious people with diabetes challenging for people. Injection can result in lower patient compliance, which in turn results in worse health outcomes. Over the past 100 years, physicians and scientists have searched for a method to deliver insulin using an oral capsule. However, the walls of the gastrointestinal tract prevent the uptake of large molecules such as insulin. A team of scientists from MIT, Harvard, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Novo Nordisk have developed a breakthrough capsule technology which overcomes this barrier. After a patient ingests the capsule, it autonomously inserts insulin into the top layers of stomach tissue. Inspired by the unique shape of leopard tortoises, which allow them to self-write from any orientation, the team designed a novel system with the ability to consistently orient and release the drug into the tissue wall. The self-orienting millimeter scale actuator, known as SOMA, consistently delivered insulin with an efficiency comparable to injection in our preclinical evaluation. Both the tortoise shell and the soma possess upper portions with pointed tops and lower portions with level bottoms. The high curvature body allows the device to reorient itself utilizing gravity alone. The flat base ensures that the soma does not tip over when moved by stomach contractions. The stomach wall's muscular tissue acts as a natural barrier and prevents the risk of perforation during drug insertion. After delivering the drug, the capsule passes safely through the body. A dissolvable timing mechanism ensures reproducible insulin delivery to the stomach wall rather than esophagus or small intestine. Insulin uptake begins within a few minutes after ingestion and continues throughout the day. In a large animal model, insulin delivered orally using the soma provided equivalent drug exposure compared to the same formulation injected under the skin. The scientists hope that this new capsule technology will eventually allow patients to take a multitude of drugs, including insulin, orally. So in another company actually further the advanced because that one is actually taken the fasting state and only you know, found its just to deliver the stomach. The, the other company is able to even uh, take the drug even to the small intestine. So this is a much modified version of the same micro needle. The difference between the first one is this one is that this is a dissolved needle. That means they, they are not stainless steel. So they dissolve over a period of time and then they just 
dissolve along with the membrane. It's, uh, it's, so you don't have to, it's still the capsule had to be removed, but the microneedles are dissolvable. So the, actually this one, they've done a study in humans in Australia with, uh, I think was it it's, uh, with, uh, with the human growth hormone. So they were able to find, find that it almost produced 70% uh, bioavailability and uh, more or less comparable to subcutaneous uh, injection of a human growth hormone, which is again as a protein, a large protein. So they're able to show in, uh, in humans, unlike the other one, which was mainly in the pigs. So definitely this uh, technologies are really uh, expanding the number of drugs can be delivered. Because again, they found a safe in the human, they did not have any significant side effects because the capsule is excreted in the feces at, uh, after the delivery is done. Ronnie Therapeutics, an InCube Labs company, has created a novel approach for the oral delivery of biologics, including proteins, peptides, and antibodies. These drugs are currently only available as an injection, many of which cause pain and discomfort to the patient. In many cases, patients will delay or skip a treatment due to pain or inconvenience of an injection. The Rani pill is swallowed by the patient. To the patient, it appears to be a standard capsule, but inside the pill, there is a delivery mechanism that injects the drug directly into the intestinal wall. The intestinal injection is pain-free because the intestines do not have sharp pain receptors. Once delivered, the drug is quickly absorbed through the highly vascularized intestinal wall. The components of the pill either dissolve or are passed out safely. Ronnie's approach eliminates the need for injections and offers patients a more convenient and pain-free way to take their medication. As a result, a daily pill as an alternative to an injection is expected to have a positive impact on patient compliance. An optional feature of the Rani pill is a tiny wireless sensor that is activated once the needle is delivered. Upon needle delivery, a radio transmitter embedded in the Rani pill emits a signal to an external receiver connected to a cell phone carried by the patient. An app on the cell phone records the date and time of drug delivery and also transmits this information to a cloud-based database. If a patient forgets to take the Rani pill, the smartphone app sends a reminder message to the patient which can further improve compliance. During clinical trials, knowing the exact time of drug delivery is helpful in pharmacokinetic studies with short half-life drugs. In addition, the data from all the patient's cell phones will be collated via the cloud by the CRO. Rani wireless monitoring can also be used in post-market surveillance or phase four studies. Our goal is to deliver any peptide, protein, or antibody on the RANI platform. So finally, the last part of the AGA trial, which is the colon. So here, most of the focus, of course, to treat more uh, uh, the local disease or post-systemic. Now, there are different diseases like ulcerative colon disease, Crohn's disease, of course, and colon cancer. So the colon is a little bit different. Physiologically speaking, doesn't have villi. It's a lot of solid mass, very less water, very limited absorption. But the interesting thing is, the drug, the GA transit time here is you know, anywhere from a few hours of, from, from, from 10 hours to even 60 hours, depending on the bowel movement habits of the individual. So really it gives a lot of time for drug absorption, especially to treat local conditions. Now, interesting, there's also 400 different species of bacteria. And this has been a very in, an intense area of study lately. So initially it was believed that uh, genome, of course, we you know genome may, you know, influences the diet and you know, disease was healthy uh, health and also the immunology, but also now people think it's a, a triad of the microbiome, uh, genome, as well as the Im Im immunity, which all three together interplays what causes the disease with somebody being healthy. So, so you can actually utilize this bacteria to deliver the drugs specifically targeted to the colon. So for example, there's a product called you know, as sulfidin, which is basically a sulfur salicin chemical name. It has a azo bond, which is Fimina salicylic sulfa, but both are anti inflammatory drugs which are used for uh, ulcerative colitis. So the drug is not released. It's a co drug, actually. You know, the drug is released in the bacteria, produce, the enzyme produced with the bacteria, azoridectase, breaks down this bond to release both the drug and to act locally in the colon. So this is very specific in the colon and not released in any other part of the GA tract. People use the same mechanism to coat drug with polymers, which are broken by polymers, uh, uh, polymerases, for example, the, the, which is produced with bacteria, like chitosan, some of the natural polymers are actually broken down by the uh, bacteria. So you can also achieve target delivery of some, uh, some of the systems, a regular tablet by coating the polymer, which is broken by the bacteria in the colon. Now, the one thing I want to really talk about is the microbiome. So uh, one of the diseases that is difficult to treat is a uh, disease called Clostridium difficile, which is an infection. 
majority of the 90% antibiotics don't work so they are very resistant and it's all a very severe disease it can cause severe inflammation so because there are four hundred species of bacteria they're all anaerobic it's very difficult to grow them all of them although there are a lot of probiotic in the market and there's people also talk prebiotic prebiotic is nothing but fibers to grow the uh, beneficial bacteria in the so we have a lot of beneficial bacteria so for example like lactobacillus so whenever you take an antibiotic you usually have diarrhea the reason is because antibiotic kills both the uh, good bacteria as well as bad bacteria so that's why you get the stomach upset so people always in india they uh, drink yogurt which has a uh, which is basically as lactobacillus to replenish the lost bacteria so prebiotics basically fibers to grow the beneficial bacteria and recently people have talked about postbiotic because sometimes probiotic when you give the bacteria very few bacteria can reach in a regular capsule because they can degrade by the stomach as well as intestinal ph so many many of the bacteria may not reach there so people have talked about the postbiotic postbiotic is nothing but what was released by the bacteria in fact now people have figured out that the things produced by the bacteria like simple uh, short fatty acids can have tremendous significant effects on the body including some mental disorders so instead of giving the probiotic that let me can give the postbiotic so for the clostridium difficile what people have done is actually they've asked the healthy donors to uh, donate the fecal material and the live flies in a capsule or in some cases they are liquid and again these are done in clinical trials they have produced significant uh, benefit in clostridium difficile basically it's called fecal transplant so you can take it orally a capsule which most of it will reach the colon or you can use a like endoscopic procedure to give the liquid surgically it is done as well they have found tremendous benefit uh, 90% of patients are you know benefited from just fecal transplant there are also currently studies going of ulcerative colitis and even for autism uh, but of course again it's not approved yet but there are a lot of clinical trials going on using healthy um, fecal material bacteria because it's very difficult to reproduce as bacteria so rather they would take the fecal material lyophilize it and then give it as a capsule Yeah, sorry, Doctor uh, Doctor Holmes. Uh, we'll give few minutes for question and uh, session. Yeah, I'm. I'm just uh, last slide, uh, Doctor Kumar. Sorry, with the video is too bit. Yeah, I'm almost done here. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so just to end it. So again, uh, you know, hopefully, I've given some examples to show how the some of the barriers can be overcome by using some delivery systems. So I said that the first generation is mainly focused on the uh, uh, overcome the physical properties of drug. The second generation focused on the biological barriers. the third generation like the ones i showed the examples you have to overcome both the physical property challenges but also the biological barriers so similar to the phone uh, as i talked about the one g so the different g's that different generations the drug delivery is also in parallel you can see that as we have more understanding the biology and uh, we understand the barriers we are also able to overcome some of the challenges what we uh, see with the different routes administration especially the oral route so if you really think you know combining all the we talk about personalized medicine a lot so we know pharmacogenomics we can figure out you know what drugs work for people there is a proteomics there is now the microbiome is another thing i talked about so we talked about 3d printing so to truly when you talk about precision medicine or uh, personalized medicine so once you have the pharmacogenomics you can give the right drug the right dose to the right patient and you can print the right you now you can print it in a dosage form and actually you can give the precise dose in a precise shape or to the right in the right uh, dosage form so if you combine the 3d printing and the pharmacogenomics really you're talking about precision and personalized medicine and also later there have a lot of uh, you know interest in what is called as a tattoo based medicines where they have a small you know circuits inserted in the patches which can sense but also deliver the drug again this is all investigating at this point of time so really it's we are really advancing a stage with the with the technology we are able to precisely deliver the drug to the right dose to the right patient at the right time so to to conclude So I talked about 3Ds, but again, as I said, to you know, we are getting to a phase where the future we might, you know, when you combine this pharmacogenomics and you get the right prescription for the uh, for the patient, and if you can use 3D printing, you can easily really customize the uh, appropriate dosage form to the uh, the the patient. So with that, I'll I'll stop here and take any questions. I apologize, it took a little bit longer because of the video, so sorry about that. Dr. Kumar, yes, sir. Meet me, okay. Sorry, I didn't know if you're able to hear me. Sir, uh, there are specific questions uh, from the Zoom. So one of the pa participants, uh, Dr. Nikunj Mish Kishor Mishra, Dr. Nikunj Kishor Mishra, is asking, uh, in case of 
gastrointestinal drug delivery system in case of a narrow absorption sometimes bioavailability may be hampered for certain drug is it the case sir yeah that's a good question so obviously the as i said you know if you remember i said it's it's not for all drugs right so so as i said weakly acidic drugs and it's it's not a one size fits all that's where the 3d come to play right so you have to really make sure you use the appropriate drugs in this for in this case so it has to be a weak elastic drug which is primarily absorbed in the stomach so like for example the gabapentin example i gave you so uh, in pharmacokinetic studies what they found was uh, when they give in a in a conventional gabapentin the absorption bioavailability is much lower than when you give in a gastroenteritis system partly because the gabapentin receptors apparently you know there's more receptors on the duodenum so when you are able to read in the drug in the stomach the drug the release is able to get to the receptor which is not possible in a conventional dosage form because it doesn't stay long in the absorption window so to answer the question yes the bile will depend on the type of drug it is not for all drugs so weak elastic drugs and for example like antibiotics why why is the prophylaxis given in stomach because as you know one of the side effects of the antibiotics is they can kill the normal flora in the colon so we're able to deliver the drug in the stomach so hopefully you're able to avoid some of the side effects that you see and you know, like di- diarrhea side of it that you see because of the you know the drug reaching the colon so minimize the drug reaching the colon so so it has to be a drug specific not a one size fits all thank you sir uh, sir uh, one of the participant uh, has asked a question what is the ideal release time for a floating gastric gastro retentive drug delivery system so again i mean again i again i will go to the so it's not a one size fits all right so you have to consider the drug of course the drug pharmacokinetics and of course the disease you now how long you want to uh, deliver the drug typically what is currently what is in the market currently if you look at the products in the market like the gralis i talked about or the the uh, glumets uh, they are typically between 10 to 12 hours uh, is what the release is so for of course it also will depend on the half life of the drug per se so uh, i have not seen anything in the market which is beyond the uh, 12 hours at, at this point because the ones they showed is not in the market right some of the things they talked about the star shaped system they are not in the market so you know obviously there still a lot more uh, studies need to happen before it can get to the market so typically it been 10 to 12 hours sir one more question sir so what is the effect of body position and foot intake sir, on the floating drug delivery system yeah that's a good question so yeah definitely yeah, that does impact obviously fluid intake also impacts So there is, um, of course, you know, like any other dosage form, the physiological factor is going to impact, right? Uh, the type of food you take, and you know, again, that type of uh, the calorie intake would also impact the release. Definitely, that's a, that's a variable, right? There is going to be some variation because of that. Now, if you remember the one I talked about, the uh, microneedle, which is of course not, not in the market yet, they have found that when you take with the fasted state, it doesn't really, uh, you don't get a lot of absorption, especially for insulin, for example. But they typically you have to give in a in a fasting state for it to have enough absor- absorption so the, the yeah the, 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 that's a proper question so again the posture the fluid all of those things does influence the absorption so again that is why you have different routes administration right you know depending on the type of drug you're trying to deliver so definitely there are some limitations thank you sir uh, so another participant have asked a question So, what is the best biodegradable polymer for uh, GRDDs? Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I, I I hate to say this, but I think it has to be specific, right? So, there are several uh, polymers in the you know, in, in the, uh, of course, we have a lot of excipients to choose from. So, yeah, it has to go back to the release uh, release type of release you want to have and how long, right? So, you typically what they do is it's not a one one polymer will not do the job. You have to use a mixture of polymers. and most of them would be slow dissolving polymer or i would say they are mixture of a non degradable and degradable polymer like polyethylene oxide for example hpmc so hpmc more degradable polyethylene oxide may not be degradable so it will be excreted in the feces like a shell so it depends on the type of polymer you, type of release candidates you want to achieve yes the participants can ask the questions from the zoom Uh, a very good morning uh, professor om perumal sir this is the second time i am listening to your presentation and last time if i remember you were talking on the role of the biopharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics okay now it's a very good presentation uh, just out of curiosity i am asking sir are you working in any of these 3d printing technologies 
No, I, I am not. So again, uh, if you, uh, the one thing which I probably should have said this. So if you look at uh, look up a lot of the innovation that has happened in drug delivery, actually does not come from pharmaceutics. It's come from uh, chemical engineers. Yes. If you look at the device, right? So really, pharmacy is the interface of the metal science and and of the, the biology, right? So a lot of the device side of things have come from um, from the uh, chemical engineer side. So to to answer your question, no, I, and especially I'm not working on it. But right now, I think there are commercial printers you can get. But here's a challenge. You know, one could ask, argue, you know, there's so much of 3D printers out there. Why don't we have a lot of 3D printer products? The biggest challenge is the a um, lot of the regulatory issues, right? For example, if it's a controlled substance, if people start making their own products in their home, so that is where I think a lot of the regulatory issues need to happen. But also, there is also from a technology standpoint, there are some challenges in terms of uh, you know the the type of material that can be used for 3D printing. So still, that's being you know evolving, and uh, there is a you know in UK there is a group which is working on currently they have develop different types of printers for different types of, uh, you know, what do you call it? metals, the different characteristics. So that is another limitation in terms of translating those. Yes, I'm, personally, I'm not working on the 3D printing. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So with this one, I request uh, Dr. Kalyani to propose a quote of time. The really and thought-provoking and interesting session, sir. On behalf of our Vice Chairman Sir, Vice Chairman Sir, Director Sir, and Principal Sir, I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Om Perumal Garu, for giving, for giving an excellent presentation and making this seminar very meaningful and interesting. And I would like to thank our Director Sir, Dr. Kumar V. S. Namani Sir, and Principal Sir, K. S. Nataraj Garu, Dr. K. S. Nataraj Garu, for the guidance and moral support. I also convey my thanks to AACG for providing this financial support for this program. I'm delighted to express a vote of thanks to our staff that has made this webinar a grand success through their motivation and dedication and constant support. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar and uh, the college administration. Actually, I see Dr. Rao was one of my teachers. So again, Dr. Rao, nice to see you. Thanks for attending. Again, thanks to all the participants. Thank you for all the participants and uh, the feedback as well as attendance link is posted in the chat box of the Zoom as well as the YouTube. Thank you one and all. So thank you Dr. Rob. I think it's too late for you. Thank you for taking your time and giving your enlightening talk to us. Hope to see you. No, 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 no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank, thank you Dr. Rob. Namaskaram sir. Yeah. Sir, regarding uh, session two, please. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Regarding session two, you can uh, give us the information. We will shortly, we'll shortly start our session two within uh, 15 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. Dear participants, we will shortly start our. Uh, Session two of day one within, uh, within five to ten minutes. Please stay with us. Thank you. You can have a small break and you can rejoin us. Within ten minutes, we'll start our. Uh, Session two for day one. Thank you.
Yes, Sunil. Hello. Morning, sir. Yeah. Very nice to see you, sir. Yeah. Good morning. Very nice to see you. I think I have seen you somewhere. I could not able to recollect it. You feel the same way, sir. Huh? Yes, I mean, uh, I'm also thinking that, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. So this is uh, I'm also Subramanian only. Oh, nice to meet you. Good morning, because the top left to many last ten years. Okay, sir. I'm director of this institute. Yes, sir. Happy to see you today. 